Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. Now, amid last year's market uncertainties, sticking to plan A seemed beyond challenging. And yet, staying grounded in the face of doubts has never been more crucial. And today's guest, he set up his own business in the last recession and is a major proponent of having a crisis playbook and actually sticking to it during a period of uncertainty. And in general, his attitude to facing any recession is don't hide, be visible, and take an obvious lead on implementing that crisis playbook. He's Umesh Sakdev, and he's the CEO and co-founder of Unifor. And the company recently became a unicorn, and the privately held startup company has a value of over $2.5 billion, and it originally made its name in conversational AI much of which is used to help contact centre agents have easier and more efficient conversations by harnessing machine learnings, not to replace humans, but to make humans better, to make their life easier. And he has an inspiring story to share with us today. So buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to California, where Umesh is waiting to talk about all that and also the future of AI in our work. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Neil, thank you for having me on the show. It's great to uh, be chatting with you today. My name is Umesh Sachdev. I'm the founder and CEO of Unifor. We are a conversational AI and automation company headquartered here in Palo Alto, California. And we're in the business of, uh, of making human conversations easier and derive value out of them using artificial intelligence and workflow automation technology. We service businesses and customers around the world who run either massive contact centers or rely on video meetings like the one we're doing uh, to conduct business in different departments in their organization. And of course, artificial intelligence, workflow automation, all huge, huge topics at the moment. And before we dive into that, though, I'd love to find a little bit more about how you got to your current role, your journey, as they say. So can I ask that you share your origin story, where your passion for tech first came from, or or maybe just a moment that would ultimately put you on this path you're on, don't I? Yeah, that takes me back 15, 16 years ago, Neil. Mm. Uh, I founded Unifor in 2008. And we are going through an economic recession currently, and 2008 was the the last one that most people remember. And there were a few like me who were thinking of founding new businesses in that year. Mm. And this is go back to how we entrepreneurs and founders are wired in our heads. And so the motivation for me to get on the entrepreneurial path or the path of building products and technologies that Unifor today sells in the marketplace was around, I was living in India, born and raised in India. And one of the motivations is I realized early on that out of the 1.3, 1.4 billion people that live in India, 80%, eight, 900 million people would not participate in the digital revolution like you and I do. In other words, they won't access the internet like you and I do. And that's not because they, they don't have the tools or the mechanism is just that internet was being developed in the English language. And for, uh, for 70, 80% of Indians who live in states where English is not their first language, they're going to find it hard to access the internet. And that insight led me to research a new human machine interface using voice recognition and artificial intelligence and natural language processing, etc., to allow people at the base of the pyramid in in a country like India to use their voice to speak to a low cost mobile device and get answers back in a language of their choosing where the the answers are coming from the internet. That was the original motivation to start researching in the technology area, et cetera. And that has led us to develop uh, obviously the, the core technology, which involves speech, involves natural language, uh, involves understanding human emotions and behavior using artificial intelligence. And then over time, we realized that all of these people that we are building the technology for are customers of either a bank, trying to do a banking transaction done, or they're customers of a healthcare uh, ecosystem where they're trying to get information or some help, 
are their customers of uh, you know a, a service which provides them weather information and things like that. And so we we decided to become a B two B SaaS company that services businesses around the world and eases access for their end customers using our technology. So let me give you a couple of examples. Customers in North America, irrespective of what economic class or or, uh, ecosystem they belong to, when they want to call their telecom operator and say that, you know, something went wrong or my billing was overcharged or I don't have data, I need help. Today, the scenario in the US is they're faced with hours and hours of waiting queue because there's just so many less people in the call centers answering their calls. And occasionally when they do get to an executive after waiting for hours in the queue, that executive, given the the dearth of people we have, might be a new employee of the organization who's not fully well-versed. And sometimes after waiting for hours, you may not get the right help in the connect center. And so Uniforce technology in that case, first of all, eases the queue. We give these telecom companies the ability to say, if there are calls coming in, which can be automated today with very sophisticated AI technology and a voice bot can interface with the customer, then let's ease the pain of the customer and let's not put them through a long queue. Now, in the case of it being a complex discussion where the bot you know, may not be able to resolve the answer completely and it has to reach an executive, Then when the executive is talking to the consumer, let's say the consumer is saying, I lost data. Can you please check what happened? Instead of the employee telling the consumer that let me put you on hold and let me figure out why you lost data, we have our technology which combines AI and robotics at real time present the answer to the employee of the telecom company. And so... Even for that employee, instead of trying to look at different screens and different applications and trying to find that answer, the answer is right there. So for the consumer, she doesn't have to be put on hold. The executive on the other side found the resolution pretty fast. Instead of it being a 15 minute call, the call got done in three and the consumer can go back doing their day job and not get frustrated the employee of the organization can now service more customers. And that telecom organization now had a big bottom line increase because you can do more with less number of employees in the call center. You can service more customers, you can take on more traffic. Another example, and then I'll you know, move on to connecting the dots to why we started the company. We recognize that lots of hardworking people in enterprises, like my own company today, made a huge adjustment when the pandemic occurred. We went from seeing our colleagues and customers in person, in offices, in restaurants, in events and gatherings to video meetings over Zoom or WebEx or Teams and other platforms like that. And that was a huge adjustment, why? Because as as the human species, one of the superpowers we have is our cognitive ability allows us to read each other's body language and facial expressions and connect with each other. That's how we establish trust, Neil, all right? And so all of a sudden, everyone who's in the sales department or the marketing department or the HR department was learning new skills to establish trust without meeting the people on the other end. And so at that point, we had done an acquisition And we had acquired a company out of Spain, which is called Emotion Research Lab. So in addition to the technology that Uniforce worked on in the last 15 years, which is understanding human speech and tone and behavior, this company had developed the technology to use computer vision and detect facial emotion and body language changes in real time. And so with the the power of these combined technologies, we now have products that we have sales executives in different companies and who are trying to learn this new skill of building a rapport and building a relationship and breaking the ice with customers on video meetings. And we now give them AI tools on their video meetings and say, looks like you still haven't answered the CIO's question. What they really meant when they were asking this question was how do you price yourself? Mm -hmm. 
And so here's probably the right answer for you. So really taking technology as an approach of aiding all of the employees of an enterprise, whether they're in the call center or sales, et cetera, and allowing them to be extremely efficient in their jobs. And that's one of the reasons I was excited to get you on the podcast today, because when we hear artificial intelligence or AI, there's a lot of knee-jerk reactions going on at the moment with so many different uh, things that are being released and a lot of companies or a lot of people fearing for their future and maybe the company will replace their, their job roles with AI. But I always maintain that it's when technology and AI work together, that's when the real magic happens. And it's not about replacing people. And listening to you there, I mean, we've all been in those situations where we've been caught on hold and we're getting more and more frustrated. And equally, the call center agent, and they've got a huge queue and it's pretty soul destroying just to see that queue not going out all day. And it it feels like conversational AI, it it works for everyone here. It works for the employee. It works for the customer. Is that what you've always said? set out to achieve when better serving customers while helping the the call center agents too? Neil, uh, where you're leading me is time and again, each time there has been a new milestone yeah. in the area of artificial intelligence, this debate surfaces again. And often, yeah. clearly the developments at OpenAI and ChatGPT have put a lot of discussion in the public forum about what are the jobs that can get eliminated and mm. you know what kind of tasks we no longer need humans to do. But philosophically, it's time immemorial. If you go back to the Industrial Revolution, if you go back to Henry Ford putting up the first automated factory line, or the time hundreds of years ago when we invented the first tractors, and we were telling farmers and fields that you no longer have to walk your fields uh, 10 times a day, you can use mechanized tools, to the Silicon Revolution where computers came in, And people in banks and other places said, what do you mean I won't have to sign manual ledgers and checks? Are you saying a computer can do my job? Mm. Each time a technology revolution has occurred in the history of the human race, human beings have evolved to do higher order jobs and left the mundane and repetitive jobs to machines and and the evolution of technology. And so AI is one such moment that will go down in the history book of human race, where once again, it allowed all human beings to evolve to do higher order jobs. So let's take the call center. This technology, while it can use chat bots and voice bots and have a real dynamic conversation with you and I, Mm. but I don't think this technology in our lifetime is reaching a point where it it can be as empathetic so if I, if I call you from the middle of the road and say, you know, I'm stuck, I have, a, I have a flat tire, I need help. Of course, we have the AI technology that understands what you're asking for and will schedule a car. Whereas if you were to say this to a real call center agent, assisted with AI, they'll still send you a car, but say, you know what, I'm going to be on the call while you're on the road. I see you're distressed. Let's just chat. Are you okay? I know it must be really terrible. It's that human connection that we have with each other, which I don't think AI in our lifetime is going to be able to achieve. It's, it's going to make us more and more efficient. It's going to allow us to say, just take care of the customer, make sure they're okay. I'm going to do the task of shipping the, the, the assistance vehicle, et cetera. So technology takes over the mundane task, whereas we human beings evolve to doing higher order, more complex and more difficult uh, tasks. So I do not believe that any evolution in AI that we're seeing today is about taking away jobs. It's about taking away the tasks, which are repetitive and mundane in different spheres of life. But it's an opportunity for all of us to evolve to doing more complex things that only human beings are capable of doing. Completely agree with you. I mean, you mentioned Chat GPT there, which there's a bit of controversy at the minute, but I've I've always thought how much more productive and efficient would the average office worker be if, let's say, Microsoft Office put Chat GPT in there? They could create their spreadsheet with just asking for the uh, the formula. They could automate emails and there's so much that could go on there. But we're not here to talk about that, of course. I'm here to talk about Unifor and 
Can you expand on how Unifor's Emotion AI technology actually assists in those sales calls and, and also pitch presentations? Is that right? Absolutely. So once again, goes back to the mission of Unifor and why we build technology and why we do what we do. Yeah. Like I said, we realized that as salespeople were retraining themselves to now reach out to customers on emails and then straight up a quick Zoom meeting, let me tell you what my company does. Let me do a quick demo. What you're really missing is in the past, when I used to go on a sales call, we usually used to go in, in pairs or a small bunch. And whoever is doing the main presentation or the pitch, the other person knew their job, which was to come out of the meeting and the pitch and say, I was silently reading the room. When you were pitching, I was watching how people were receiving it. And I think we, we, we really got, we hit a chord with the, the finance executive, but I think the CIO still has uh, some unanswered questions. So next time, let's come back and answer those questions. How do you do that kind of reading the room mm. in a, a 20 inch or a 24 inch computer monitor on a video meeting? And you know, worse still, if your presentation is on the screen and there are 16 participants, the participants are small boxes on a gallery that it's hard to pay attention to. So contrary to the big uh, gift that human beings have that we can look at many places while we're speaking, on a video meeting like this, if we are looking at our presentation, that gift is taken away. We can't look at people's reactions. We can't establish trust. I don't know when to slow down and say, Neil, I think... I think you still have a question. Do you want me to slow down here? Yeah. I can't do that on a video meeting if there are too many of us and I'm passionately making a pitch. And so the Emotion AI technology of Unifor combines a few signals that it's picking up in real time. It's picking up the words coming out of the picture and how they're saying it in terms of how their tone is changing. It's paying attention to what's on the screen. Is there a presentation? Is there a demo? And then it's paying attention to how is it being received by every participant who's in that small gallery thumbnail, because the AI model is focusing on changes in facial emotion. Does somebody raise their eyebrow? Does somebody nod? Does somebody get distracted on their iPhone and looks away from the camera, et cetera, all right? So with combination of these signals being processed, and in a meeting, these could be millions of signals every minute. Okay, even though it's, it's a few people, the AI technology is then, think of it as your, uh, as your assistant or your reading the room partner nudging you with the elbow that, you know, why don't we answer the CIS question? Mm -hmm. I think we still haven't answered that question. Or the CTO seems to have received a call. Give them a minute pause. Give them a minute to come back into the meeting, et cetera, because you might have missed it that CIO is in the third screen of the gallery view, but the AI picked it up. And so allowing the salesperson and the pitcher in the meeting to be better aware and read the room, come out of the meeting, because most of these sales calls are very seldom one and done. You're part of a long sales cycle. You meet the customer over and over, over a few weeks or months for the whole sales cycle to be completed. And so helping the rep even better forecast. Because a lot of times the rep can feel that was a great meeting. But if there were a person observing everybody you might come back and say, are you kidding me? We're in the same room. I don't think we're even close to winning their confidence. We have work to do. What does that mean? It just means you need more data to forecast whether you're gonna convert the business or not, uh, when you want it this quarter or next quarter, et cetera. And so really helping sales reps in this new virtual world, read the room better during the meeting, forecast deals better across sales cycles, and just allowing both sellers and buyers have a better experience of building trust with each other on these video meetings. Love that. And if we just take a break from the technology side of things for a moment, before you came on the podcast, I was doing a little research on Unifor, and I was learning how you guys quickly became a unicorn company and also achieved a $400 million funding round last year. Can I ask that you share the story and what drove that funding round too? Absolutely, Neil. So clearly the world is looking very different in 2023. 
then it was a late 21 or early 22, right? Yeah. Uh, combined with high inflation around the world and, you know, fears of recession in some parts of the world, stock markets have, have started to look very different from uh, a couple of years ago. But that said, we spoke of Unifor's birth and genesis in the year of 2008. So you speak of our last financing round where we raised $400 million at a 2.5 billion valuation. Yeah. And uh, it made a lot of headlines. We got a lot of congratulatory messages when that happened. But I had to remind a lot of my friends that we are an overnight success that's been around 15 years yeah. to reach this milestone. Okay. So, you know, over the, the life cycle of this company, we've raised over $600 million of external capital, which has largely allowed us to create all these cool products and, you know, technologies which are research driven, but are now servicing. Uh, hundreds of thousands of customers and end users uh, around the world every month in, in 17 different countries. Our technology works in over 100 languages. Okay, so uh, the process of raising financing, the process of getting valued is ultimately about what's the potential of the business, right? For an investor to look at a business and say, I'm investing $1 in you and I expect that with that $1, you're going to do something even more interesting than you've done in the past. You create new products, expand geographically to new countries, and or just you know, invest in sales and marketing. And you know, company is going to get much bigger than what it is today. So it's a combination of, we believe the opportunity in front of Unifor is about a $2 trillion market opportunity. Okay, If we combine the opportunity of assisting and automating all phone calls and all video meetings occurring in any company, any business today, that's a very massive market opportunity. And we're just scratching the surface. Being around for as many years and uh, servicing so many customers and earning their trust has put Unifor as one of the largest companies in our space already, right? So we are emerging as that early winner, which has all the depth of technology, has the number of customers, has the growth and revenue, and there is such a large market that it's not likely that this growth is going to taper off anytime soon. We can have decades of this high growth in front of us. And then the factor that as we, you know, we've seen economic cycles are, you know, they're cyclical. Stock markets go up and they go down. But when they go down, some of the weaker companies sometimes have great products, but may not have yet achieved the financing, the critical mass of the customer base, they struggle to continue a standalone businesses. And so that gives opportunity for companies like Unifor to also look at acquisition opportunities and bring bright younger companies into our fold and provide a much better offering to our customers. So we have the opportunity to do, to do all of the above, which is continue our fast growth paths uh, through this economic a recessionary uh, environment, use the, the capital available for the right opportunities to look at inorganic ways of growth and acquisitions. We're in 17 countries, but there's many countries in the world and many parts of the world that we're not servicing today. And so those are still opportunities for us to go in. And as one of the larger players, it's incumbent on us to define this new category, to define that conversationally is not about replacing jobs, but assisting humans, et cetera. We, we are the company that bears the burden of charting the course and doing it responsibly for the entire industry. I just wanted to give a quick mention to our sponsors because this month the podcast is brought to you by Flipper, which is the number one marketplace to buy and sell online businesses and startups. So do you run your own online business? And have you ever considered selling your website, your store, your tech, or your app? Because with world-class combined matching technology, dedicated brokers, and end-to-end -end services, all at the most efficient price, Flipper is making it simple to sell your online business. So to get a free valuation, visit my friends at flipper.com slash tech talks, where each month thousands of online business owners exit with Flipper. Again, Visit flipper.com slash tech talks.
And as you said there, you have a a 15-year overnight success story. And many people don't see that long climb up to the summit of the mountain, which you clearly have been on. And I'm curious, though, how would you say Unifor's expansion into Emotion AI has, has impacted the company's growth and success? Has it been a big part of that? Absolutely. Uh, if I think about uh, everything you've discussed so far, Neil, company that started with the mission of helping human beings and individuals, first at the base of the pyramid in India, and then focusing on every employee in a company that struggles now to adjust to this new virtual world, etc. cetera, um, then becoming a company that services the world, the globe, and you know, becoming the largest by revenue size, by growth rate. So once again, it's incumbent on us to charter the vision for conversational AI. And if I think, if I take a set step back from this treadmill where we have to deliver results every quarter, and I think about what is conversational AI? If AI or technology has to come close to how human beings communicate with each other, that's really what it is. It's mm. getting AI to converse with human beings like we do with each other. Then we really have to think about what are the signals cognitively that we as human beings process in real time to have a meaningful conversation. It's not just that you and I are texting each other all the time. Yeah. If, you, if you move to a phone call, we can hear each other's tone and I can say, Neil, have you seen that cool new product? And you can hear the excitement in my voice in addition to my words. Or I can say, Neil, I have some terrible news. That friend of ours uh, has a health emergency. So you can hear the messages in how I change my tone, right? Now, if you're doing a video meeting, then in, in addition to the words and the tone, we are paying attention to each other's facial engagement and reaction. How intently are we looking at the camera? Or are we leaning back and looking away? And then finally, if we move from the virtual world to an in-person, then I'm not only paying attention to your words, your tone, your facial, but also body language and gesture. If I'm sitting across the table from you in a conference room, if I stand up and start walking in the conference room, that in itself is sending a conversational signal. Mm. Okay. So the human mind processes all of this for a meaningful conversation and not one of the things alone. Okay. Which is why adding emotion AI on top of conversational AI was the next evolutionary chapter for us to keep evolving AI to get closer and closer to how the human brain works. And so clearly we are now being thoughtful to say, we've got uh, the words understood. We've got the tonal changes understood. We now have facial emotion being covered by emotion AI. But now the this field of research we're being very thoughtful about is behavioral AI, okay? Ultimately, this is all about how we as human beings are behaving, right? Mm -hmm. I'm picking up the signal, I'm picking up your emotion, I'm picking up your words, but now can I get AI to pay attention to and predict how human beings are going to behave in a certain scenario, in a crisis, in a sales call, in a customer support issue where you're really frustrated, et cetera, all right? So our research continues beyond emotion AI, now thinking about behavioral AI, and hopefully we'll speak again shortly and I'll report back some progress that our, our teams are making in that area. But each time we make our AI do these superlative things and gain new capability, it allows us to build new products and our features for our customers. And that ultimately drives the growth in our business. And in, when I was preparing for our conversation today, I was also reading, I think it was verified market research, that the sales enable, enablement market is expected to be worth something like $7.3 billion globally by 2028. So with that in mind, how do you see Unifor positioning itself in this market? And what would you say sets you apart from, from your competitors in this space? Yeah. So I'd say my estimate, personal estimate, is that's going to be bigger. Yeah. than what the report's mentioning. Once again, if we, if we take a step back, Neil, think about the contact center market is known to be a $300 plus billion market opportunity already. Yeah. Okay. Now, the revenue intelligence market, let's just say that report is, is what we uh, you know, take for, for, uh, for argument's sake. That's another 7 to $10 billion of market opportunity over the next decade. 
But then that's not it. There are so many use cases in the areas of marketing, in customer success, and HR. And with similar opportunities where employees are trying to conduct business over phone calls and video meetings and can, can use the assistance that these technology tools can provide in various ways. So if I add up the potential segments that Unifor has the opportunity to play it, we're talking about an over a trillion dollars of market opportunity in front of us, okay? And we are the only emerging true platform player that is straddling between not just call center and not just revenue and not just marketing, but we are a true horizontal platform which is using the same technology, but applying it in different use cases and allowing customers in different segments. So you speak of differentiation from our peer group. I like when uh, a space is competitive because I've spent the majority of the last 15 years of this company's history being the only one talking about conversational AI and computers can talk like us. Uh, I, I founded Unifor when there was no Apple Siri or there was no... Uh, Android, uh, uh, Google Home. And so these were the days where uh, people like you and I had not experienced the power of conversational AI, mm. okay? Over time, as technology has matured, more and more competitors have come into each of these spaces. And that actually helps grow the space. It matures the space. But the, the key differentiation in our strategy amongst any of our peers is that, like I said, we have competitors who focused on call centers and chatbots. And then we have competitors who focused on the revenue intelligence market. And then we have competitors who focused on the marketing part of the market. We are the only player who's emerged as a true platform which can take the same architecture and apply to all those industry segments at the same time, which is why it's showing in how large we are relative to the rest of them, how we're growing relative to the rest of them. But like I said, make no mistake, I love bright competitive uh, companies around us because it pushes us to keep driving our innovation. It matures the market. It gives our customers more choice, which is, you know, in my world, a very good thing because, you know, the customer should go around looking at what options exist and what makes sense for them, right? Uh, for some customers, uh, knowing that they can do 17 different things with just one company, namely Unifor, is a good thing. That they don't have to buy seven different products from seven different companies and then get an eighth company to make the products work together. With Unifor, that comes naturally to them. And although we are talking today, and there's 5,000 miles between us there, I think we're both seeing economic uncertainty on both sides of the pond, and we're seeing it, trends happening all over the world. So for any business leaders, decision makers, or startup founders that are listening, how would you advise that they could better strike the balance between perseverance and rigidity, and, and especially during a time of crisis? And, and what ways do you think sticking to a long-term plan like a crisis playbook can actually help a business to rebound during these difficult times. So, Neil, that's a great point that you bring. I'm a glass half full kind yeah. of guy. I'm an optimist. Uh, and that's the way I built this company over many years, sometimes with uh, very little resources and sometimes with more resources. We've seen all kinds of cycles in the last 15 years of building Unifor. And I'd say uh, moments like these, are great opportunities for innovative startups to break out. You know, when the times are so good as they have been for the last decade, it's really hard to challenge the big giants in every space, the big technology companies, the big oil companies, the big financials. But every time there's been a recession, that gives an opportunity for the playing field to get more level for everyone. And for innovative startups that built their business with a little bit of discipline, and are willing to put in those, those years and the perseverance, like you mentioned, with grit, mm. it gives them a chance to come up on the leaderboard when just like the smaller companies, the big companies tend to start struggle. So that we're going to be for the next few months, at least, if not the whole year, in some sort of an, a dynamic economic situation, um, I see it as a huge opportunity for innovative startups. The playbook that I apply in these cases, depending on 
the strength of somebody's balance sheet. It's very context driven. You might have a strong balance sheet going in or you might not. But the playbook is first, hunker down and think about surviving. Reduce expenditure to a point where you keep the innovation engine going, you keep the core business going. But anything else that is a long-term plan, that is a long-term initiative and potentially could wait a few months, should wait a few months. Then I'd say once I've you know, extended the runway uh, meaningfully, then I go back to my leadership team and say, okay, we're fine now. More importantly, let's talk about like every cycle, this cycle will end, whether it ends late 23 or early 24 or mid 24, it will end. What do we want our company to feel like and look like then? What's our vision for our company then? And let's solve for it. And like in our case, I'll give you the unit for example, we said we are already the largest company. We're probably three or four times bigger than the next known competitor. And my, my leadership team said, okay, Omesh, let's paint a vision by the time the cycle ends, because we are going in with a strong balance sheet. We raised the 400 million last year. Let's not squander that opportunity. We should be the absolute uh, undisputed leader of our market. We should be five or six times bigger than our competitors. Assuming our competitors will also grow, which means we have to grow much faster than them. And so uh, let's grow our business. Let's also do acquisitions. Let's come out on the other side being the absolute undisputed leader of the conversational AI market. And so extending the runway, being prudent, having a vision of what you want your company to, to feel like and look like on the other side, and then you know working on it. Because what's really important to understand is like every cycle, this cycle will end. There are brighter days ahead. And you always want to prepare your, your leadership team, get them in the mindset that we might be leaner today. We might be forced to do more with less. That's actually going to get us really prepared for when the tide turns. We will be ready to shift gears and go at a pace that none of our competitors can. So I'd say just you know, hunkering down for the period of uncertainty, but preparing for the period of, uh, of better economic times, which are going to come, and being around and being ready to pounce on those opportunities. That's really my playbook. And of course, your expansion into Emotion AI impacted your company's growth and success. So with all that in mind, is there any additional advice you'd offer to anybody listening on determining the right time to enter a new market and any additional factors they, they should be considering when, when making a decision like that? Neil, when in doubt in, a, you know, in running business, yeah. and whether there's a question of entering a new market, should we develop a new product, should we acquire a company? When I have questions like these, and I'm not able to get clear answers one way or another, yeah. My playbook is I just go to my customers and I have an honest conversation with them. Customers will tell you all the time what's right for you to be doing, whether it's time for you to enter a new segment. And if your customers say, if you were to enter that new segment, I think I'll work with you. Mm -hmm. That's the time you do it. Or if your customers say, why bother? No, that segment is not where I'm focusing on, at least for the foreseeable future. And or there are so many other players in that other segment. You're good at this one thing. Keep doing that one thing. Usually, I find my, my clarity of thought when I spend time with my customers, which is why as a CEO, I religiously, I have a rule, and my admin knows this, every month, no matter what I'm doing, no matter what's the pressure on me, I spend 20 to 30% of my time meeting customers around the world. Uh, and now that goes up in some periods towards the end of the quarter, towards the end of the financial year. But even in a steady state, there isn't a single month that I'm not meeting tens of customers in any city, any, any country that I visit. Okay? And that gives me the opportunity to determine the answers to the kind of questions you just posed to me. When is the right time to enter a new product, a new market, a new geography? Or I have an acquisition opportunity I can see myself going either way, should I do it or not? Once again, speak to your customers. They will give you the answer. Fantastic advice. And we started the podcast today talking about your origin story. 
what's what put you on this path where your passion of technology came from but as we almost reflect back across your career now at the end of the podcast of course none of us are able to achieve any degree of success without a little help along the way so i'm curious is that a particular person that you're grateful towards maybe someone uh, saw something in you invested a little time in you or someone that helped you get where you are today is there anyone you'd like to thank like that neil throughout my career i have probably hundreds of people to thank who mm. you know took a bet on me decided to spend time with me mentor me coach me sometimes knowingly and sometimes unknowingly i'm mm. i'm learning from people sometimes without them knowing that they're giving me a gift so i'm always very grateful to all my coaches and mentors and people who provided inspiration in the tech industry there are so many tall leaders that i you know uh, that i follow their lead John Chambers who built Cisco over many years is on my board and a, and a mentor. I look at people like Steve Jobs, Tim Cook in the current times, Elon Musk. Uh, you know, I may not subscribe to some, some personality factors there, but there's a lot of innovation that Elon Musk is teaching all of us. So I'm really an inspired human being by all of these leaders. But if you push me to think about one individual who's really had a very meaningful role in shaping who I am today, as a leader as a ceo and help shape the company uh, unifor in many ways with the right values with the right ethics uh, etc i'd go back to my original mentor professor uh, ashok junjanwala is his name he's an academic in india he teaches in india's number one university iit madras and over his career he straddled the world of academia startups he's mentored many like me he's advised the government in india and, and several other parts of the world um, and he's also advised several large enterprises i would say he had uh, one of the most uh, prominent roles to play at a impressionable age when i was just thinking about you know my career in technology uh, as an entrepreneur etc some of the value systems even today he and i don't speak as much as we used to in the past every time i visit india uh, i try to visit his his family in his house meet his wife as well uh, but even today making decisions around managing uh, uh, managing cash managing money dealing with customers thinking about innovation all the time thinking about investor money as my own money and spending every dollar responsibly treating every employee with tremendous empathy and emotion and treating them as human beings uh, and not just people who are serving a purpose of an enterprise all these value systems are ingrained with me because i was spending the time i was in those years when we were founding uniform with and in his incubation cell okay so even today believe it or not there are many times where you know we have an end of quarter crunch and we have to hit mark and we have to close a deal and you know do something to uh, to deliver on the goals that we promised the street or our investors and even while making those fast decisions my subconscious goes into will professor jindalwala be proud of this act or not mm. okay so that's how big of a mark it has left on me and i think that's going to last me a lifetime and like i said i'm eternally grateful for people especially professor jindalwala who who just were willing to spend selflessly so much time in shaping and molding my thinking and giving me the inspiration giving me the motivation and you know when the time was right even course correcting when it when i had to and you know today that i'm a leader i'm inclined to pass on all that wisdom to as many people as i can because there were people before me who were doing it selflessly for me if they hadn't spent the time i wouldn't be what i am today and for me this is my opportunity to start paying it forward to the next generation such a powerful answer and obviously a very special person uh, and before i let you go what is the best place for listeners to find unifor or your team online and maybe find out more about anything that we talked about today what's the best starting point well neil uh, we are uh, we are very uh, present and active all across the web certainly social media unifor website www.unifor.com pretty simply has a ton of information on what we do so if anything i've said uh, has interested anyone i would encourage to, them to go to our website my own linkedin and twitter are very active and dynamic places i engage with the community through that 
So does Unifor. Unifor's own uh, LinkedIn and Twitter handles uh, are very active. Uh, and on a given month, we see tons of people reaching out to us and engaging with us and sharing ideas or asking us questions or applying for jobs. And so my personal social media, Unifor social media, or the Unifor website would be places that I'd recommend anyone who's, who's, who has any interest in the company to, to visit. Well, I'll add all those links to the show notes so people can find you nice and easily. And so much I loved about our conversation. I always say at the end of every episode that technology works best when it brings people together. And I love how you're leveraging technology to make more efficient conversations by harnessing machine learning to ultimately make humans better. And you've done all that and also took uh, a lot of time today sharing your origin story. What put you on this path to a a unicorn company valued at over $2.5 billion? Absolutely phenomenal, inspirational too. But more than anything, just thank you for sharing it with me today. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. I love how the company has recently expanded the business into Emotion AI, which is a subset of AI that is able to gouge human emotions and send the reaction of individuals on sales calls and provide feedback to sellers and pitchers and highlight the most engaging parts of a pitch or the points of concern that they might need to address. But again, more than anything, it's about how technology is bringing people together, how it's helping humans be better. So a big thank you to him for coming on here and sharing his story. And if you've got a stare and if you've got a story to share, I want to hear from you. And there are many ways that you can contact me. Simply email me at techblogwriter at outlook.com. If you would like to slide into my DMs and send me an audio message on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok, you can find me at Neil C. Hughes. But a big thank you for listening as always. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Oh,